Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of Anyone Can Click where we break down photography to its absolute basics one week at a time. Today we will be covering the third and the final tool of the exposure triangle and that is ISO. If you have had some exposure to ISO in the past you will find this video particularly interesting because today we will be uncovering three truths about ISO that very few people know. So without further ado, let's begin. So what is ISO? No. Let's start today's video with a different question. What is a camera sensor? And to answer that, I'm going to dial back 20-30 years ago to the era of film cameras. And let me show you something. Do you remember this little guy? This is a piece of a 35mm film roll. And I can still see the photographs that it has managed to capture. Our vacations were incomplete without carrying one of these in our travel bags. But then the digital era came in and these guys completely vanished. Or did they? The reality is they actually returned, reincarnated as the sensor in the digital camera. The same size, the same function, just a different way of working, a new avatar. So let's learn a little bit more about the sensor of the digital camera. A sensor is a device which is made up of millions of light sensitive cells. Now when light enters the camera through the aperture, through the open shutter curtains, it falls on the sensor and an electrical signal is created. It is this very signal that then gets processed and converted to digital data, which is how our photographs are stored in the digital camera. Now the strength of the signal is directly proportional to the intensity of light that's falling on the cell. More the intensity, stronger is the signal and brighter is our photograph. Now, this is the right time to introduce you to the textbook definition of exposure, which is a little different from the way we've been treating it so far. So exposure is basically the amount of light that falls on the sensor. And you guessed it right. It depends on two factors. It depends on the size of the opening, which is a aperture, and it depends on the time for which the shutter curtains remain open and that is shutter speed. But both of these factors have their limitations. A lens can only have a certain maximum aperture size beyond which it is physically incapable of letting in more light. On the other hand, the shutter speed too has its limitations. We cannot make the shutter speed too slow because then we will end up with shaky and blurry photographs which are going to be unusable. So how then do we photograph in a situation where there isn't enough light? Perhaps early in the morning or late in the evening or maybe on an overcast day or even indoors because in all of these situations there is never going to be enough light to create a signal that is strong enough to give us that perfectly exposed photograph. Even if we max out our aperture, even if we max out our shutter speed. How then do we make a photograph in such situations? To solve this problem, there is one other step between signal creation and its conversion to digital data and this is the step of amplification. This is our checkpoint number three and this is ISO. ISO amplifies the signal that is created by the sensor. So for the same amount of light, it is creating a much stronger signal which is going to correspond to a much well exposed final photograph. Think of the ISO as a volume button. Now when we increase the volume, we increase the loudness of sound. So similarly, when we increase our ISO, we are increasing the brightness of our photograph. Now this works differently as compared to shutter speed and aperture, which are directly impacting the amount of light that's falling on the sensor but it does indirectly contribute towards the final exposure of the photograph and hence it is considered as a part of the exposure triangle and this brings me to truth number one. ISO 
does not increase the sensitivity of the sensor it only amplifies the signal that is created by the sensor it does not magically make the sensor more sensitive to light so it can attract more light or hold more light because these are versions that i heard about iso back in the day when i began my photography journey but the truth is iso does not affect the amount of light that falls on the sensor at all and this brings me to truth number 2 and that is iso does not affect exposure when we speak about exposure we're talking about the amount of light the amount of pure light that's falling on the sensor and which is creating that signal iso has no role to play in that like we discussed the only two factors which are affecting exposure are shutter speed and aperture so let's understand how does iso work it is a fairly straightforward relation just like the volume button we increase the iso we increase the amplification and we increase the light in the photograph now the typical iso range in digital cameras usually spans from about iso 100 to iso 6400 but some advanced cameras can offer an even wider range Let's take a look at some images to understand this better. Notice how as I'm changing my ISO, my image is getting progressively brighter. So now we're going to park these two truths aside and we're going to learn a little bit more about ISO and the process of signal creation. We said that when light falls on the sensor, it creates an electrical signal. But that's not all. It also creates some kind of interference some kind of unwanted effect which we term as noise now this noise is because of the working of the sensor it is because of the nature of light and it is because of factors which are beyond our control basically in the process of making an image some amount of noise is inevitable of course different sensors create different degrees of signal and noise which is why some camera bodies are so much more expensive than others but that said we all have to live with the fact that there is going to be a little noise when we take our photograph in fact you will notice more of this noise in the darker parts of the photograph now in normal course this noise is barely perceivable but as we start increasing our iso as we start amplifying our signal we also start to amplify our noise and there will come a point where this noise is going to become so evident that it will start to affect the quality of the photograph now i'm going to zoom into the photograph and this time notice the green and the disturbance that you see in the zoomed in part of the photograph when i start to increase the iso but this is not the only problem of high iso values When the ISO becomes too high it also affects the dynamic range of the camera. Now dynamic range is the range of tones that the camera can capture from darkest to lightest. We will cover dynamic range and the concept of tones along with the concept of shadows, highlights and other features of a photograph in a different episode. But the thing to remember is that at very high ISO levels the number of tones that the camera can capture is going to decrease which is again not what we desire it is for these two reasons it is always advisable to strive for the lowest possible iso that we can manage correct not always and this brings me to truth number 3 the iso trade off now when we start off photography we get obsessed with trying to keep our iso at the most minimum level possible It almost starts to feel like an accomplishment when we manage to take a photograph at that ISO 100 and ISO 200. What we don't realize is sometimes that comes at an irreparable cost. But before we understand that, let's look at the reality of ISO today. Today cameras have gotten so good that they are managing noise much better than ever before. In fact, if there is some residual noise that does show up, there are post processing softwares and techniques that again have gotten extremely good at eliminating that noise at managing that noise 
and all of these are perfectly acceptable techniques. So what this tells us is that it's okay to end up with a little bit of noise in our photograph. What is not okay is ending up with a photograph that is shaky or blurry. This is particularly relevant when we are photographing in the semi-automatic modes where the camera adjusts one or more tools of the exposure triangle. And many times, this tool is the shutter speed. Now, if the ISO is too low, the camera will compensate this shortfall in light by using a longer shutter speed. And that can result in blurry and shaky photographs. Or ending up with a photograph that is out of focus because there is nothing that can repair a photograph like that. This is the classic beginner's mistake when it comes to ISO. And many times, in this race to keep the ISO as low as possible, we miscalculate the ISO number, especially at the beginning phases of photography. This is actually, if you think about it, a catch-22 situation. Because we think about these decisions about increasing the ISO in low light situations. And it is precisely in these low light situations where the shutter speed sometimes gets so low that we end up with shaky and blurry, unusable photographs. So the most important lesson to remember when it comes to ISO is when in doubt, always err on the side of excess. Keep that ISO a little more higher if you are worried about your shutter speed. We will learn more about this in the next two, three episodes where we will put everything that we have learned about the exposure triangle, aperture, shutter speed and ISO together and we will learn how to practically apply that in a scene to click a photograph. Now that we've reached almost the end of the video, I'm sure you must be wondering, do we really need to get into this degree of technicalities of ISO? Does it really matter? The answer is yes. Because understanding the meaning of ISO, understanding the purpose of ISO will go on to shape the way we understand exposure it will shape the way we manage our settings, the way we handle our noise. And let me explain that to you with the help of this last analogy. Now imagine that I want 100 ml of orange juice. Now, the best case scenario is that I get all the juice from oranges. But what if I don't have as many oranges? In such a situation, I'm going to try and extract as much juice as I possibly can from the oranges I have and only then will I bridge the gap with water to get that 100 ml of orange juice. That's typically how orange juice is even sold in Tetra Packs today. But the point is, we never do it the other way around. We do not first take water and then fill up the gap using orange juice. That water is ISO. The orange juice, like you guessed it, is light. It is exposure. What this tells us is that ISO cannot be treated in the same vein as shutter speed and aperture. It is not a replacement for shutter speed and aperture. It is an additional tool. It is a lever that is used to bridge the gap that shutter speed and aperture are not able to do. With that, we have reached the end of this video on ISO. If you have found the three truths about ISO interesting, if you found this video of value, please do like, subscribe and comment. I would love to hear your thoughts, your feedback and yes, it would greatly help the channel. In the next episode, like I mentioned, we will put everything that we have learned so far together and learn about the exposure triangle theory and its practical application. Until then, take care. Goodbye.